Welcome to Desolate Eda. Wow, we're back, and I'm almost over my plague sickness, and uh, we're going to be doing some more fun desk and Lady Ada broadcasts. I'm Lady Ada. I'm the engineer here, and this is my desk, and with me is Mr. Lady Ada, who's on camera control. Hello. And we're broadcasting from my bedroom, and uh, today, tonight, we're going to be talking about how to uh, control USB devices with Python and LibUSB which is one of my most favoritest things in the world. I love it more than cookies. Um, <laughs> having LibUSB is one of like the neatest libraries ever made. It basically allows you to do uh, USB level transfers in user space. So instead of having to write a kernel driver or like uh, use Windows programming where you're like inside the operating system and doing uh, device drivers that way, instead of having to do all of that nonsense, um, you can actually just talk to the devices sort of like you would with, with a serial port or a parallel port. And um, I just think that's so peachy. So we're going to be um, doing that uh, tonight. And um, it's, you know, a lot of people might be wondering like, wow, you're not working on a tester. Actually, it is, it is for a tester, but it, it's good uh, generic stuff to know anyways. And I want to give a shout out to um, Jen Axelson. Uh, this book is one of the best books I've ever read. It's so good that after I bought this, because I, I gave away my older version to somebody, and I don't remember who, um, I picked up another copy of this, and I realized, like, I should really have this in the Adafruit shop, so we're going to carry this as well. This is a really great book. You can pick it up from almost anywhere, and it really covers a lot of the details of USB, because it's a little co more complicated than most protocols, uh, from the low level all the way to the high level. So, um, okay, let's go to the hover. Hover over. I can show off the thing I'm working on. So this is the breakout board I'm working on. It's a uh, breakout for uh, the CP2104, which is a really nice USB serial converter chip. We actually use this in the Huzzah Feather. What's nice about this is it's a lot less expensive than the FTDI chips, like the FT232RL and 232BM and 231X, um, much, much less expensive. And it can go much, much faster. This can go up to two megabits per second. I use it at, um, to program ESP8266 at 921 kilobaud, and it's like super snappy and it works great. Uh, and it can also do arbitrary baud rates which is really nice because um, the PL2303 doesn't, for example, and it's small, it doesn't require an external crystal, it doesn't require almost any external passives, it doesn't even require uh, inline a USB resistor. So you just put a couple of capacitors on there, you're good to go, and so here's the, um, the board, and this is the chip in the center. Uh, I put two LEDs, RX and TX, on here, and I'll talk about those in a bit, and then I've got uh, GPIOs on all sides here, not the GPIOs, the uh, control signals over here, uh, like DCR and, and DSR and DCD and ring and uh, R uh, CTS and RTS. Um, so this is kind of your standard USB to serial, 0 to 3 volt, 5 volt compliant, but 0 to 3 volt logic. Really good for all sorts of microcontroller interfacing. And I kind of wanted to make something that people could use with the ESP266, but also with a nice alternative to the FTDI chip. Um, because again, it's a lot less expensive. Like I'll be able to sell this breakout for about $5. Um, not, that's not possible with a genuine FTDI chip. So uh, it's got a micro USB connector and um, let's just show it off with my Windows computer. So you want to go to um, the Windows copy? Okay, so this is the data sheet for this device. Um, but let's just start up uh, uh, XCTU. This is a, you know, a very basic um, serial console. I just kind of like this because it's uh, it has um, control over the modem pins. So, uh, oh, can we go to quad view? <laughs> yeah, let's see quad. Okay, so we've got the board down here. Oh, no, uh, with the scopey cam. Yeah, okay. So um, I've got my uh, oscilloscope hooked up, and so, like, let's connect to TXD, and, you know, you 
you type characters and um, they appear. You know, I can type different characters and you get beautiful serial pins here. And then um, you can also see the uh, red LED flashing. And then of course, if you connect, uh, let me grab this jumper and I connect RX to TX, it's a nice little echo test. And uh, now I get the red and green LEDs blinking and uh, you just believe me, there's data on the other side. And then of course there's those um, control pins. So like this is RTS. And um, you can toggle RTS with this little button here. And you can see if I do the RTS ready to send signal, the oscilloscope goes up and down. So you've got the signal pins. Uh, there's also um, pins like CTS. And CTS is an input. So you're not going to uh, see it on the oscilloscope. But if I connect it to, uh, sorry, to ground, which one's the ground pin? Oh, here you go. You'll see over here on the computer, this little green thing, it turns on and off. So it's just telling you, hey, the signal, that signal got input. There's also like uh, DSR, all these modem lines, all, all nine pin connector of them. Let's see DSR on and off. Okay, so you got all these single pins and you're like, this is so lovely, you know, I've got every control pin you could possibly want. Like again, you don't usually use them usually use RX, TX, maybe uh, RTS and uh, CTS for flow control. Uh, sometimes DTR is used to reset, um, like Arduinos, the DTR pin is toggled to reset an Arduino. Um, with the ESP266, there's a little bit of like, frankly, kind of weird transistor noodling to um, get the GPIO and uh, reset pins to go off and to put it to bootloader mode. So you can kind of abuse those pins a little bit, which is nice. And there's also a couple of other uh, pins available. So this is just the schematic for it. And um, this shows you over here. Oh, can I go to copy view? Just, uh, just copy. Thanks. Um, okay, so you got, you know, this is the schematic for it. You've got the control pins, ring, a DTR, DSR, RX, TX over here. And then uh, there's also a couple outputs, uh, reset and suspend. So you can reset the chip if you want to, which is kind of cute. There's the USB section over here. A um, couple capacitors needed just for setting it up. It's actually a microcontroller inside, right? There's, it's not like a special ROM chip. I, I don't believe that. It's probably a microcontroller um, that Scilabs adjusted or something. It's, it's a pretty common thing to do. And uh, it's, it's generic, and they've used it for a couple different chips. Um, and then there is this GPIO 0, 1, 2, and 3. So GPIO... These are signals for status and control, and um, GPIO pins. Let's go to that chapter, chapter seven. Okay, so there's four GPIO pins, um, and three of them have like alternate uses. So GPIO zero and one, I'm actually using them to control LEDs, and you set it in the ROM, and that's like a complicated, weird situation with that, and maybe I'll do a future video. But you can set these up to toggle the LEDs. And so the red and green LEDs I have, those are connected to these two GPIOs that are from this chip, and it basically blinks them, which is I think is really nice. I think if I'm going to have something that's an FTDI um, comparison, it has to be as good as the FTDI friend, which has those really lovely receive and transmit blinkies. I think for the extra three cents, it's worth it. OK, so we already, you know, this is already on my schematic, this LED open drain toggle pin control. I'm not using RS-45, I can do RS-45. And then it kind of never mentions it again, but there's like, there's other two GPIOs, right? GPIO 2 and GPIO 3. And let's go and look at my breakout. USB serial, CP. And we can look at this board. So, um, okay. So yeah, I've got the modem control pins, and then I've got the LEDs on um, GPIO 0 and GPIO 1. But then there's two more GPIOs, GPIO 2 and 3. And these are not being used. And so the question is, well, like, how do you use them? Like, it, it, there are these pins that you could take advantage of, maybe do something with. Um, let's say you wanted a separate signal that was not one of these that you could use maybe for bit bang controlling something or, or doing a manual reset where you don't want to use the RTS or, or CTS lines or whatever. 
So you can use these as inputs and outputs, but there is no part of the USB serial interface that gives you access, right? The, the RI pin and the RX and TX, those are controlled by the CDC, the whatever data communications default USB uh, standard, right? There's like get ring, set ring, get RTS, set RTS, whatever, all of those control lines and like send byte, receive byte. But there's no like generic GPIO control for those. There's no way in the driver for us to do that. It just doesn't exist. There's no, these are like kind of extras that are tacked on. Okay, so how do you control them if you want to? Well, there's a um, app note from Scilabs. I hope it's pronounced Scilabs because that's how I say it. It could be Syllabs, but I think Scilabs sounds better. And so they talk about, you know, the virtual COM port interface and, um, you know, they talk about flow control and how they do it and stuff. And then what they actually do is kind of interesting is they get into the low level hardware description of this device. So they say, okay, here's your descriptor. And like, I'm not going to go to descriptors, like just read, read Jen Axelson's book, really. It, she covers all of this stuff. It's kind of awesome. Um, but it basically says, you know, your vendor ID, your product ID, and uh, descriptors and all that good stuff. And then you're like, okay, this is great. But what I really want to do is control these GPIOs. And then they actually get to, you know, there's like every single, and some of these are like standardized requests. But deep down in this data sheet, page 17, you get to vendor specific. So these are vendor specific commands that you can send that you can use to control those GPIOs. And like, you know, why am I doing this? Well, mostly because in the tester, I want to be able to make sure that those pins are connected. So I have to toggle them. I have to basically turn them on and off somehow and detect that those pins moved up and down. And there's no way for me to do that unless I have a hook into them. So we're gonna use these vendor specific commands. Vendor specific, OXFF. VM request type, request, value, index, length. So this is the structure for the request. And we'll, we'll get back to this in a little bit. But what we want to do is basically send a raw request to the USB device with the control endpoint. This is the endpoint that isn't used for data, it's used for like telling it what to do. Like for example, if you want to tell the chip, I want to open up the port at 9600 baud, that's a control request. Or if you want to tell it to like toggle the pins up and down, that's also a control request. When you want to send data, like the RX and TX data, that's a data request that's probably in a separate endpoint. Okay, so the only thing is it's a little annoying to use libusb under Windows because it already is attached to a kernel driver, like the Windows driver. So I'm actually gonna do this on a Raspberry Pi. So I'm gonna disconnect, and I'm gonna hook this up to my Raspberry Pi because Linux is just like super chill. Like as long as you run as root, like you're your user, you're a root user, but you don't have to be in kernel space. So it's lovely. Sometimes you do have to detach the kernel driver, but it, it turns out in this case you don't. So you have to learn how to send these requests. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, you're gonna do that with libusb. And libusb is a cross-platform user library to access USB devices. This is a, a platform that's been ported to multiple programming languages. I tend to use Python because it's the fastest, easiest way to sort of script up uh, these testers, and I like it. Um, but you can also do it in C and probably like, you know, Ruby and like Perl, and they have hooks for everything. It's in C and then they just wrap it for whatever, you know, scripting language you want. Uh, and it's pretty straightforward. Basically, you just tell the libusb core, hey, give me like a handle for this device, and then you can just send it requests. And um, I have a, a longer tutorial that talks about how to fuzz USB devices with libusb for, um, we did this for the connect hack. So it's kind of funny because I, I got to refer to my old, um, uh, my old tutorial. But once in a while, you know, every year or two, I end up having to do this because I have some chip and I have to get into some weird mode or I want to automate something. And libusb is just an awesome way to do that. So let's go to our Raspberry Pi. Okay, so I got my Raspberry Pi, and then uh, I guess I can we can use like this section of the screen, and then if you want to do the thing, if you want to zoom in, how about that's great, lovely. 
Okay, so let's uh, start up a new Python script. Oh, sorry. Hello. I'm not ready to run it yet. I gotta make it. Okay, so uh, user. Actually, I'll just run Python. I don't remember what, I don't remember what Python lives. And uh, I'm going to crib, but you guys can't see my crib notes because I don't remember the entire API off the top of my head. But you want to do stuff like, okay, so start with import time because I want to do some delay later. And then um, import USB core and I'm also going to import USB util. Um, to do this, I believe I did a pip sudo pip install pi USB. I'm trying to remember what. Yeah, it's already there, but pi USB is what you want to use. Basically, um, if you're writing code in Python, you already know you want to like get pip installed or whatever, and then install pi USB. Um, Google for that, and then you, once you install it, you're good to go. Okay, so you've installed pi USB. And uh, we're back. Okay, so that import should work. So next up, you need to know the VID and the PID of the device that you want to grab. The, each device has a unique vendor identifier and a unique product identifier. You can also do it by hubs and ports and stuff, I think, but the easiest way to do it, to be honest, is to uh, tell LibUSB, hey, to grab the item by VID and PID. That means you can only have one of those devices plugged in because if you have like two CP2104, they won't know which one, but like we're not doing that. That's for another time. So uh, run LSUSB, which is a lovely utility, and it will tell you all of the items that you have plugged in. For example, you know, I have a, a Wi Fi adapter, and this Wi Fi adapter is uh, ID OBDA colon 717 8176. That's VAD and PID, but that's actually not the device we want. Instead, we want this device, which is the CP210X UART Bridge, also known as the My AVR Smart USB Lite. I guess it was used in some product. So they, they give you a hint as to what it might be. But it's, uh, so that's in hex, great. So go back to our device, and then we'll put in VID. And don't forget the OX because this is Next, you want to tell the USB device, hey, the LibUSB core, hey, uh, get me that VID PID. Let, find this device for me. Wow, that is so easy. Um, all you have to do is say USB core find. Amazing. And then you just tell it the vendor ID. And you tell it the product ID. Amazing, isn't it? So. And if it finds it, you know, it'll return true or it'll return a, a proper device. But if not, print could not find CP2104. So sad. And then you want to exit. Otherwise, you should print, yeehaw, found a CP2104 device. And then we still want to exit, but we'll exit in a nice way. Okay, great. So this is just like our most basic code. So let's save it and then run. So it says, I found it. Um, oh, hold on. Let me uh, actually reach the end. Hold on. Let me pull this up. Okay, so it says it found it. So now I'm going to do a trick where I unplug the device, where right? you want to make sure. And I run it and it says it couldn't find it. Okay, so good. So if, it, if it's plugged in, it can find it. If it's not plugged in, it can't find it. I am apparently inside the code. Okay, so we're back to our program. Okay, so we found the device. Excellent. So here's actually where we get to do what we want. So what we want to um, do is uh, connect to the control endpoint. And um, again, Gen Axelson covers all this stuff about endpoints and interfaces, but we're just going to, um, actually, do we need to know that? No, we don't, sorry. The control, you can send a control transfer without knowing the actual uh, endpoint and interface. You just, you send it just a, you just say, hey, I want to send a control transfer. So to send a control transfer, 
you um, run dev, so that's the device, the device that we have grabbed, dev control transfer, and then you put in the uh, request type, the BREC, the WVAL, the W index, and then data. And if you Google for, oops, wrong code, lib, lib USB, let's look at the API. It'll probably, somewhere in here it'll be documented. Get port, get handle, init. Okay, maybe I'll search for the Pi USB control transfer. Okay, so here it is in docs. Okay, so yeah, this basically kind of is doing the same thing, but control transfer. Do they have documentation? Yeah, it's here somewhere. All right, I don't know where it is, but basically somewhere it documents that order of um, arguments, but uh, you'll just have to try. Oh, can we uh, just zoom into the small text? Yeah, can finish writing this code. Okay, so um, so you need to you're gonna do a control transfer with um, the request type, the request itself, the value of the request, the index of the request, and the data. Um, and the B and the W just tell you that it's a byte and a word. And uh, this is what we're going to go back to. Uh, the data sheet. Okay, so uh, in that data sheet, I'll shrink this down so it fits. Um, we want to use right latch to toggle that pin. So we want BM request type, and then this is like 01001. So this is uh, OX41. The B request is OXFF. The W val is 37E1. Um, the right latch value is the index. W length is zero, and the data is none. So you actually are cheating by putting the, the value of what you want to write to that um, GPIO in W index. Okay, so we'll go back here. And then we'll just say rec type equals OX41, because that's the request type, if you remember from, from right here. Oh, hold on. From, this is the request type from, man, it's not, uh, there you go. This is the request type over here. And then for B request, it's going to be that vendor specific, which is FF. And then W value is OX. 37E1. And then uh, W index is the put stuff here. That's going to be what we actually change around. And then data is actually empty, the empty set. We're not actually going to send anything. OK, so next up we have to figure out like what is the, how do we actually write the data? So they say, here, um, the the right latch the right latch value that is supplied in W index is as following: bit zero through seven, mask of the latch state to write, where bit zero is GPIO zero, bit one is GPIO one, up to GPIO n, and then the higher byte is the actual state. So there's a mask of what bytes you want to write, and then what the value is going to be. So I want to toggle. I'm going to have W index be. Uh, OX, sorry, it's going to be one, shifted over two times, and then OR that with uh, one, shifted over two times, and then shifted over eight times. So the, the high byte has one, has basically, well, I'll just say OX4. It's probably a little easier to, OX4 for GPIO two, and then, so just 4-4. Four, four. So GPIO2 is OX04. OK. OK, so we write that index value. 
And then what I want to do afterwards is sleep for like a tenth of a second. And then I will make the uh, W index equal. Sorry, the mask is still going to be OX04. But then I'm not going to write to the high byte. I'm going to have that be zero. So it basically turns the, this request turns the GPIO on, and then this request turns it off. That's pretty much it. And then, uh, then I exit. OK, so let's try this. And OK, so let's go to quad view. OK, so. I'm going to scope out GPIO2. And right now it's high, but hopefully we'll be able to get it to toggle. So let's watch for the um, data line over there. Did it work? Oh, it said WVAL now. Oh, hold on. WVAL is actually called WValue. Fix that. OK, so if you saw that very briefly, every time I run it, there's a bit of a toggle very fast. So I want to actually make this happen a little faster. So let's, um, let's just do this on repeat while true. And then I'll put another time sleep here. OK, so now it's going to just repeat forever until I hit Control C. This is like exactly. OK, so you can see we've got our lovely little GPIO toggling. That's nice. And then if we look at the other pins, like GPIO 3, it's not toggling. So we're only toggling GPIO 2 by setting that mask. And then you know if we want to toggle GPIO, Three as well. Let's um, have them so they alternate. So we'll um, mask off. We'll also mask off uh, OX eight. So GPIO three, which is the fourth bit. And sorry, that's I keep forgetting. This is that. That's the high byte. OX eight. If you're smart, like do defines and stuff. Don't don't have all this bit stuff on your own. And then OX08. Eight. So this will alternate. It'll it'll have both um, GPIOs on. Hold on, Just get my bit mask. There you go. It'll have both GPIO active, but it'll alternate which one gets turned on. OK, so we're back. We've got this. And then let me get my other scopey probe. Always, always exactly in the wrong location. And let's scope out IO3. And you can see that, yeah, we have them alternating. Yay, isn't that lovely? So um, now it's like, OK, we got, we got the GPIO twiddling. It's very easy. I mean, once you know what to do, just send the control transfer, do exactly what the data sheet says. How hard can it be? Just follow the data sheet. So if I'm going to make a spaceship, I'm going to call it just read the data sheet. Um, it's figuring out what line of the data sheet to read is the tough part. You know, in the, in the movie Contact, they just sent the data sheet, and, the, and that's what we had to build. We had to build that machine. Yeah. And the book had. Similar plot, but a lot of people probably saw the movie. But yeah, just send a data sheet. Just send a data sheet. Just send a data sheet over <laughs> over a satellite. It's it's like you know it's like that story. It's like the it's like the fellow who you know had to fix the machine and he took a hammer and he and he hit it in a certain spot and somebody was like, okay, that that was great. You fixed it so easy. He's like that. It'll be ten thousand dollars. And the factory owner said, well, how, how could you cost ten thousand dollars? All he did was like hit the machine in a little spot. The fellow said, yes, I'm charging you five cents for hitting the machine and $9,995 for knowing where to hit it <laughs> and how hard. Yeah, 
think that that's a uh, retelling of a Picasso quote I heard, which is I think the story's been told. Yeah, time, like why you know someone someone asked Picasso for a, a a quick drawing, and he said that'll be like you know ten thousand dollars, and it's like well, it only took you a second, and you're like well it took me like fifty years to be Picasso though. <laughs> He was kind of a jerk. Yeah. Okay, so what I did now is I, uh, I uncommented the time sleep because actually I'm curious, like, how fast can I toggle the pins? Because if you want to use this for, let's say you want to use this for, I don't know, you're like, I want to implement SWD over uh, these two GPIO pins because you're insane. Um, how fast could you toggle these pins? Okay, so now we're running and it's pretty fast. Let's zoom in and see how fast it is. So, pretty much exactly a kilohertz, which is kind of creepy. Um, I wonder if there's something that is delaying a millisecond per transaction or something. Oh, you know what? That's probably it. There's probably a millisecond per transaction, so it can't toggle faster than that. Well, one kilohertz isn't um, what well, isn't too bad. I mean, if you wanted to to bit bang something, um, you know, it's fast enough to like PWM. Uh, sorry, to. Uh, to you know, control something over SPI, or or if you want to turn on and off an LED very very fast, you could you could do that as well. But probably fake some PWMing um, if you really needed to. You'd have to be running these requests constantly, but looks like they pretty much just run. So that's how you do raw data control transfers to USB devices. So now that I have uh, gotten those GPIOs working, so I've been able to test every GPIO. I of course tested the, the RX and TX. That was easy. I got uh, the 5 volt and 3 volt pins are easy to test. The reset pin is easy to test. Um, the suspend and unsuspend pins, I figured out how to test those by uh, unbinding the device driver in Linux. And um, the other control lines are easy, so that the only thing that I had to do was figure out how to test these pins. So what's really nice is what I'll probably do is I can connect these two to these two GPIOs to Raspberry Pi GPIO pins. And then I'll toggle them and then read the pin on the other side. That way I'll know that those pins came through and were connected. So that's a good way to do a full functional test of every exposed pin. And um, when I do the write-up for this product, I'll also have this little bit of code to be like, hey, for people who want to twiddle these GPIO pins, this is how you do it. And that's what I had to show tonight. OK. OK? So are there any oh, questions? Oh, cool. Mike is in chat. Mike, Mike says, Who's uh, Mike? I know somebody likes. No, Micah. Micah. Yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, USB has a one millisecond frame size. Yeah, I was thinking. I was thinking like I was like, why didn't this? Oh, right, because it's the through the transaction. See, yeah. this is why you should read. I should be Jan Axelson's agent because you should read Jan Axelson's book USB Complete. Is then you would remember about how USB has a one millisecond per, per frame uh, transfer time slice. Yeah. Whatever. I'm sure. I'll, I'm sure it's in like. I'm sure it's on page two. It's like. Dear Lamour, did you remember that every millisecond there's a USB transfer? Anyways. All right, and folks like the um, the way we're doing the transparency with the code thing. I know, I am in the code. Yeah, I think it's hard to show code live in a person, so this might be a solution. So, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to remember where. It is in here. It, it talks about, like, yeah, basically there's a transit. The, the, what's neat about USB is there's little, these little pulses that happen every millisecond. So if you're interested in more, I did write a tutorial in my uh, earlier life. Uh, and it's on Learn. So uh, props to Scilabs for actually putting that documentation up. But um, the Connect hack that we did is um, has a little bit about this as well. and also goes into more detail about installing Pi USB and then like how to do the control transfers. It's, it's all in here as well. So I kind of like, you know, read, read this as I just trying to remember like how to do this stuff. But basically, you know, yeah, find the device. And then you can set configuration if you need to. And then you can do control transfers and, and have fun uh, sending and transmitting um, data between you and your Connect. So basically what we did is we got the Connect. To, we figured out the, um, by just guessing, we figured out which was the accelerometer and which one was the uh, motor control. So the motor is controlled through a, a control transfer as well. Okay, how about you answer this, answer this question and then we're going to get out of here. Ready? Yeah. All right, someone wants to know, they're wiring up a 5-volt relay and they're out of diodes. Can they just use an LED instead? Mm. No, because the LED has a limit. The LED only has a certain amount of current that it will like to, to have code through it. 
and that limit is probably 30 milliamps. And so if your relay it p tries to pulse 30 milliamp, like it, when, we know when it releases, it, if it tries to put more than 30 milliamps through, it's, it might blow up your LED. I mean, like, if it's a very, very, very small relay, you might be able to get away with it, but I really wouldn't. I would just, just get a diode from somewhere. You can even use a Zener diode, really, like if, if the voltage is higher than the voltage you're using. But I would definitely use, um, I would use a diode. Okay. Well, that's it for tonight, folks. We'll see all of you on uh, some shows coming up. We have uh, live from Tony D's desk. We've got some Desk of Lady Ada, some Ask an Engineer, some Show and Tell. And uh, check out our... Um, our Twitter, because uh, twitter.com slash Adafruit, we're always retweeting some great videos. Uh, Micah was in the chat tonight. Yay! Uh, and now I'm looking uh, up. So it looks like isochronous packets for super speed, you can get as low as 48 microseconds per transfer, but it looks like one millisecond for most. But yeah, this is, I'm actually, you know, it's been so long since I read, I read this book in college, but I, I should read it again because there's USB 3.0. And I don't know that much about USB 3.0, so I'd like to read a little bit more about it. Also, you know, USB on the go was invented in the meantime as well. But, um, yeah, I just love this book. And I don't know who I let my book to, but I hope they enjoyed it because uh, I couldn't find it when I wanted to look this stuff up. Okay. So, okay. Say so bye to Periscope. Bye, everybody. Bye to Facebook Live. Have fun with your USB control transfers. Twitch and YouTube. All right. See you all later. Bye.